October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and today, the 19th, is International Day Against Breast Cancer. The World Health Organization marks the day to raise awareness and promote access to early diagnoses, timely and effective treatments. It is the world's most prevalent type of cancer among adults, and the WHO says more than 2.3 million cases are diagnosed globally each year. In 2020, some 685,000 deaths were attributed to the disease. Breast cancer is almost 100 times more common in women than men. Approximately 0.5 to 1% of cases occur in men. The disease occurs when abnormal breast cells grow out of control, either in one or both breasts, forming tumors. If left unchecked, the cancer cells could infiltrate the blood or lymphatic system and spread to other parts of the body and become fatal. There is no defining cause, but there are risk factors such as age, obesity, harmful use of alcohol, family history, to name a few. The likelihood of getting breast cancer increases as one ages, with most diagnosed after the age of 50. Then, genes play a part. About 5 to 10 percent of cases are linked to inherited gene mutations passed down from parents. Lifestyle habits could either improve or worsen chances of developing the disease, while being physically active and having a healthy weight lowers the risk. Research shows almost half of the cases diagnosed in 2020 were from Asia. The Asia Pacific Women's Cancer Coalition says cases in the region are expected to surge by more than 20 percent between 2020 and 2030. While the chances of dying from the disease is expected to soar by almost 30 percent. The risk is higher in lower and middle income nations due to low awareness and lack of access to medical services. And for more, we're joined by Dr. Anne Partridge, Vice Chair of Medical Oncology from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thanks very much for your time today, Doctor. Uh, so we know breast cancer is one of the most common cancers affecting women, but it affects Asian women disproportionately, uh, with cases in Asian countries now constituting 40% of those diagnosed. Why are women in this region more vulnerable? So we don't understand all of the population uh, reasons that are shifting right now around the world. But what we do know is that rates are going up in Asian countries and in particular among young women worldwide. And we think some of that has to do with our habits, with weight gain over time, with delays in having ch children for the first time, uh, and with less physical activity over time, among other things. And as with all cancers, early detection is crucial. Is there enough investment in educating and creating awareness about the risks? Well, I think things like this, and thank you for covering this, are super important. I think all women, and as you noted, men need to be aware that breast cancer um, is something they're at risk for. Anyone who has breast is at risk for it. And it's definitely a disease of aging. So women who are of aging for screening, then you want them to get screened uh, when that's something that they're doing on a population basis. And then women need to know their own family history because family history is a big predictor of risk. And if a person's at higher risk because of a strong family history, you want to make sure that person's getting screening and they may even have more special screening, additional tests, and they may even start younger than you might if you were at kind of normal population-based risk. You talk about younger, let's touch on older women now. Uh, there's debate over whether older women, uh, those over 70 years old, should be getting mammograms because of dangers around over-diagnosis and over-treatment. Uh, how effective is screening as women age? Well, so screening's really good as women age for detecting a breast cancer. So the issue is really around over treatment and it's hard to unsee a breast cancer. And so as a woman ages, generally what we think about in the field is to say, if she's got five or more years of life expectancy and she could go through the treatments that one would need, even surgery, 
were you to detect something, because screening, of course, you're detecting something generally asymptomatic without causing the person harm in the moment, then you might think about screening. If a person's otherwise ill from another disease, or they'd never be a surgical candidate for, for instance, or they're really old and the likelihood of that cancer becoming symptomatic in their lifetime is so low, then you would not want to screen that person. It just doesn't make sense when you consider their other risks health-wise. And what would be some positive examples or of initiatives or frameworks that have been adopted that we can learn from? So I think many of us have tried to follow the framework where we think about their, as they age, what's their kind of fragility and their overall health and comorbidities or the other illnesses they have. And a good rule of thumb, as I alluded to, is about, you know, if someone has a five year or more life expectancy and there are now calculators, there's one called e-prognosis that's widely available where you can calculate a person's life expectancy and you can make it, use it to make screening decisions as well as other health decisions. So that's something we use frequently. We also want women to know their own risk of getting breast cancer. And there's actually a new tool that we've created at Dana-Farber in Boston, where you can Google Dana-Farber and assess your risk. And it's a tool where women can enter their own information about their own exposures, and then they are fed back what their risks are in general and things they can do to reduce their risk based on what they put in about their habits and their family history. You talk about these tools at your institute and these conversations that we're having. Are you satisfied with the level of awareness and action being taken by women to protect themselves? Why does hesitancy still exist? Well, I think you make a really good point. I'm not satisfied because not enough women get in to get screened. Not enough women come in when they have lumps or bumps or um, nipple discharge or rashes that don't go away to get detected early because we know that early detection matters, whether it's through screening or through it's a symptom. So I think the important thing is to have conversations like we're having, make sure women of all ages, young and old, know that they are at risk for breast cancer. They should get screening if that's the appropriate thing for either their age or their risk strata. And then they need to have a doctor to communicate with or another healthcare provider should they get symptoms or have concerns so that they can be taken care of promptly and have those needs addressed. And we mentioned earlier that breast cancer in men is fairly rare, accounting for about 1% of new cases each year. What is the main thing that men should know about this? So I think men really need to know two things. One is, while it is rare, men can get breast cancer. And so lumps that don't go away, anything that's growing, men should be evaluated. Second thing is the male breast cancer is often very family hereditary oriented. So if you have a strong family history of breast cancer um, from, from a mother or a father and or um, you are worried about that, you can get genetic testing as a man and then you can be followed more carefully if you do have a known hereditary predisposition. So if a mother had a known gene pre pre predisposition or a father of a man or a sister or a brother, that man can also get tested and know whether he and his other blood relatives are at higher risk of both breast and other cancers because there are other cancers also that are associated with some of the more common uh, genes that are the changes in the genes that predispose to cancer. Pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much for your expertise this morning. Dr. Anne Partridge, Vice Chair of Medical Oncology from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute.